So I don't think I've ever finished recording a podcast, ended the podcast, and started listening to it again before I recorded the intro because it's probably going to be one of the only podcasts I've ever recorded with a guest that I listened to over 50 times. Today's podcast changed my life and I guarantee you it will change yours. I'm going to read you just a few of the things that came up because there's no way I could do this episode justice. From being made wrong as a child and getting in trouble and ended up turning that gift into something created millions of dollars. Um, how having a no from mom turned into candy, which turned into breaking houses and cars, which turned into smuggling heroin, was sentenced to 12 years in prison for smuggling drugs and now one of the most successful entrepreneurs in the world. You can't see the picture while you're in the frame. At the lowest, his daughter disowned him, his girlfriend left, and his mom was dying and surrender was the secret. How a homeless man at a gas station said one phrase that changed his entire life. What if every era of your life isn't ideal because of the lies that our brains are telling us? How doing what everyone else wanted led to prison? It took him losing his freedom to discover his freedom. Do you live from your heart or from everybody else's expectations of you? How creating value bigger than the space you are in, and he was in, cut 10 years off his federal prison sentence? What you feed your mind, who you associate with, will predict the results that you create. You don't read for memory. You read for mastery. Read until you implement. Would you listen to the same book 300 times to create the life that you want? And do you say thank you for the things that are hard? Because on the other side of thank you is the door for more, and you can't go backwards. Do you do good work? Are you mission-driven? Saying thank you, restored meetings. Do you have blood meetings and you do brain draining? And I have two more pages of notes just from listening as I record it. And so I've never done an intro like this for this long, but there is a reason. I am fucking moved. I am emotional. I'm covered in goosebumps and I had a couple of tears because it moved me and fired me up. And so get a focus spot. And this would be the podcast episode I recommend listening to five times. 10 times until you implement everything that's in it. So without further ado, let's get into the show. Everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Mind of George show. And today we are graced with greatness. It's hard to describe a man that has beautiful pearly whites, the most beautiful dreadlocks, hugs you like a father the moment you see him, is walking embodiment of joy and passion and love with the voice of an angel that leads by example as a husband and a father and is leading men into the free world of creative expression. But that is just one way that I can describe our incredible guest today, and I will never do it justice. And so for the rest of it, I'm going to let him do the rest. So Garen, welcome to the show. I'm just going to take a few seconds to just receive all of that. So anytime you go like this, is I'm scooping it all into my heart. I'll take it. <laughs> Thank you I'll so much it. for having me on, brother. Yeah, man. I, it's been a long time coming. And and I love that we met in Steph's BMW with you on crutches. And I even gave yeah. up the front seat to you. I was, I was trying to be chivalrous. And I was like, here you yeah, go. Thank we, you. Are, we are on the same path. And yeah. I, I've gotten to experience you. Uh, as a gift in person many times. I've been in your home, which by the way, thank you for allowing me into your home and um, got to witness kind of your gift and, and you are the gift here. And I always like for people to understand how we get to these points in our life, how we get to these experiences and how we cultivate such depth and range, which you are a maestro at doing. Um, but I think in order for that to be understood, we kind of have to go back to the beginning. And so I'm going to give you the reins because I listen to you talk all the time, but I would love for you to kind of tell everybody how you got here and became the man and where it all started. <laughs> how Superman got his powers. How Superman got his powers. Um, but there's like several beginnings for me. So like how far back you want me to go? I say we go the whole way and we can go deeper on the ones that, uh, that, that have some resonance. So I'll, I'll, I'll just take it back to, to childhood. I was one of those kids that was, always in trouble, but I didn't know that trouble meant that my, my version of trouble was me trying to fight for my freedom. Wear what I want to wear, singing out class, uh, disrupting class, um, like making funny jokes because I had, I had an expression that needed to get out. 
at the butt end of every time I got in trouble was a form of expression for me. And this is as I connect the dots looking backwards on my life. But I got in trouble. I got kicked out of school, in and out of juvenile, um, in, out, in, out of, in and out of alternative school, and kind of just followed that pattern into my 20s and 30s. Like I didn't, I was always ambitious, always fearless, would go and do the thing first that everybody was afraid of, mastered the art of sales because my mom would never buy me anything. So she was like, whenever you can make your own money, you can buy whatever you want. So I would break into cars, I would break into concession stands, I would sell candy, and eventually candy turned into drugs, and I would make the money so that I could buy whatever I wanted. Because what I was never taught is is how to make the money. So whenever you can make the money, I would just find any other way to make the money. Um, fast forward to when I was 19, I am literally smuggling drugs into another country because now my version of candy, <laughs> I want everybody to get this. I want you to see how ABCs works. That's the form of language. ABCs turns into words, turns into sentences, paragraphs, books, essays. Candy turned into eventually houses and cars, eventually turned into like me breaking into houses and cars, candy eventually turned into me smuggling 6.2 kilos of heroin from one country to the next. But it was fulfilling the same need of do whatever you got to do to make some money so you can buy whatever you want. Um, and of course, there's lots of stories in between that. But I eventually, it, it, it caught up with me in 2002, where after my eighth time of doing going from the UK to France, going on a ferry, ending up in, in Rotterdam, to now flying into France to go into the UK. I got caught at the border, and then I ended up getting sentenced to 12 years in prison. I ended up spending two and a half years in prison, got out, spent the next eight years trying to figure my life out, sleeping from couch to couch to couch, to girl's house, to couch, to went home. I need to leave home because it's so difficult even being at home in Texas where it was like slow in Houston. It was it was just difficult. I was like, I need to go something, go somewhere and make a name for myself. I go back to California and I'm like, man, life is just difficult. While I was in prison, things sped up and I kind of stayed in the same spot. So I started reading books started doing personal development books, reading The Power of Now, even though I didn't understand a word it was saying. But every time I was reading those books, it was like really cool things were happening in my life that you can't see the picture while you're in the frame. So even though I was getting really cool results, I didn't know how, I couldn't articulate how I was getting it. I thought it was luck. I was like, I pray every day. So maybe God is just doing it all. And I'm like, and I'm not, I don't have any action back in behind it because I'm just manifesting all these things. So I'm doing all of this and it's kind of, you go through your life and like I said, you can't see the picture while you're in the frame. And the frame of my life, it was the rises and the falls and the ups and downs. And I don't know how I got to where I got to, to the point where I was in the lowest point of my life. And it was 2011 at 3.43 in the morning. And at that time I was living in my car for two and a half years. I tried to kill myself twice. I was I was depressed. I was 40 pounds overweight. My girlfriend had pretty much broken up with me. Well, no, my daughter pretty much disowned me. My girlfriend broken up with me and my mom was dying in the hospital. All of this was happening at the same time. And that's when I had my moment of surrender. I just threw my hands up and I said, okay, I'm tired of fighting. I don't want to fight anymore. I want to be healthy. I want to be happy. I want to be surrounded by nothing but positive people. I just want to inspire people. And I want to make a bunch of money, but I want the money to represent something that I passionately believe in that I would do for free. Just show me a sign. And as I close, a week later, I'm at a gas station. Here's my sign. A homeless guy, quote unquote, walks up to me and asks me for money. And I said, you have more money than me because the, the homeless guy had a lot of money. And he said, change your mindset, change your life. And it was those words 
that had me stop. My, it was like my whole life was a lie. And the second I heard those words that was impacted by the energy at which they carried the, the engine of those words, it made me think about my life. And you think about the movie um, Sixth Sense when he didn't know he was dead. And then there was that one moment in his whole life flashed. My whole life flashed. And I was like, could all of this be a lie because of the way that I've been thinking? Okay. Well, then if I do the opposite of everything that I normally do in areas of my life where I'm not, well, it wasn't happy, my life will change. Well, it's been 11 years since that day, almost to the day. And every single day, I have trained myself to do the opposite of when I met with resistance. And that has led me in some of the most powerful rooms, read the most powerful books, that has led me into entrepreneurship, that has learned, led me into crypto, that has learned, led me into so many of these worlds that I would never be interested in, but it was the opposite of everything that I would normally do. So if you practice something 10,000 hours or at least get 100,000 reps, you'll be in the energy. You'll never master anything, but you'll be in the energy of mastery. And I have mastered, I've been, I've, I've literally, I'm in the energy of mastery when it comes to doing what I don't want to do, doing what is uncomfortable, doing the thing anyways, and an object that stays in motion and it'll stay, it'll just stay in motion until stopped by a stronger force. My opposite is so freaking powerful right now. That is why my life is the exact inverse of what it was from when I was living in my car. And now we're here. And now we're here. And, and I got to give some, some credit to how seamless that was because we also miss getting signed by Ludacris and being well, in music so much, yeah. and, I mean, like the the amount of things in eleven years feels like fourteen lifetimes for what yeah. you had to do. Now, I also and and I think this is an incredible story. I know this story, um, and I want to ask this in your lens, and and we'll give some context for everybody listening. But now, as we sit here, you said, you know, I got sentenced to twelve years in prison, but I only yeah. served two and a half. Yeah, that whole situation on paper seems like a miracle. Yeah. Now, thinking back on it, do you believe that you are exhibiting some of the things that you have now, like with your mind and with your energy and with your intention and just couldn't see it because you were in it? A absolutely. 100%. If you think in terms of like a man who who impregnates a woman, a seed, he's like it literally puts the seed in the body. And depending on if the environment is favorable, that seed will grow to be a healthy baby. Mm -hmm. But what once grew on the inside grew too big for the space that it was in. Then it was a couple of contractions. And then the next realm is a baby being born. Let's just say prison was a womb. And then once I started doing everything that I loved when I was a kid, see, I stopped doing all of that stuff. I did what everybody else wanted me to do, which is pretty much like a jail cell inside of a jail cell anyways. And in losing my freedom, I actually discovered my freedom. This is why I tell people, I always laugh when people are like, well, this president is taking away our freedom. And this government is saying, can't nobody take your freedom away. I know what it's like to actually not have your freedom. But it took that extreme for me to be serving a 12-year sentence. And while I was in the depths of prison, that's when I found true, true freedom. And true freedom for me was when I did everything that was in my heart, it was when I remembered everything that I, that I loved to do when I was a little kid that brought me so much joy. I love to paint. I love to motivate. I love to run. I love to inspire people. I love to draw portraits of people's family. And I did all of that while I was in, while I was in prison. And I remembered little version of me, what sparked me joy, what brought me, I was so happy. So me sharing my joy with the world, it was almost like giving people permission slip to actually be happy. Oh yeah, I can be happy and do the stuff that I love to do too. And that was my version of freedom. So I'm here across the entire country and across the, the, the nation. And 
more free than I'd ever been while I was outside. It didn't matter who the president was. It didn't matter what my skin color was. That None of that stuff mattered. What mattered was, Garen, are you making yourself happy mm. from what's inside? So it got to a point where a little voice had asked me to run when nobody was running in, during the promenade. And that is like what America calls the yard. There's, there's stabs, drug deals, fights, and I would see them all the time. And nobody was running. 30 days after me running, 60-something inmates was running with me. And so how I understand this is I was creating value that was bigger than the space that I was in. It started in me. It's like a cup. And it overflowed out of me into the other inmates. They started building up. They started seeing the light. They started believing themselves. They started having more hope. And then it overflowed through them into the container, into the womb of prison. Well, guess what? I poured so much that me was too big for the space, the womb of prison. So one day when I felt free, not when somebody told me I had freedom, when I embodied all the characteristics and freedom that I gave to myself, they contacted me out of nowhere. And they called me in the office and they said, Garrett, we retested the drugs, which they had no reason to retest the drugs because they already retested them three times. And for the amount, they said 90% of the drugs were fake. Wait, hold on. It was already tested three times, 6.2 kilos of heroin. But now all of a sudden I feel, I don't feel like I'm in prison inside of my own body. I actually feel free. We retested the drugs, 90% was fake. And for the amount, I mean, for the amount that was real, you've already done the time, you're free to go home. So I, I created I, I created value within myself by loving on myself and remembering what sparked joy inside of me. I brought joy to other people. Listen, no space can contain the amount of authentic joy and love when it comes to people having permission to feel free inside of their own body, it has to open up. It's a law. It is a universal law. So connecting the dots, looking backwards, I got myself into the rhythm of nature and anything that's connected to, to nature benefits from nature's resources, which always flows. Mm -hmm. God, bro, I'm 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 still covered in goosebumps like a minute after you said that because also like you were in, weren't you in prison in France? I was in prison in France, yeah, yeah. And in France, when you like get a retrial, it's not a retrial. They throw the whole thing out and like start again. There's all this like crazy legal stuff over there. It is it is the most insane thing. And in France, if you appeal, they'll see it as a sign of disrespect and they'll give you more time. Yep. And it's not like the American justice system. There's like, man, there's, it, I, there's almost no way to win. It's, unless, yeah. <laughs> unless you choose to be happy. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, like I, I have so many parallels and this is about you, but like, I think back to like, I was deployed to Somalia for 13 months and, you know, I was a 20 year old snot nosed kid. All my friends were in college and then my friends are dying next to me. And I, I, I had moments of these and moments of these things where, you know, you're like 13 months in hell. And then I end up in Afghanistan. And it wasn't until 2010 when I ended up in Afghanistan seven years later that I realized like I was there by choice. But I always got to control my destiny and where I'm going and what it was. And the, the parallels are just absolutely incredible. And so when you got out, after you got out, is that when you went to L.A.? Or did you go to Texas first? No, they had to let me out. They, they, I had cuffs on me the entire flight. They had to let me out when I reached an American soil, but they had to let me out where I flew in from, which was New York. Okay. So I went to New York first and I stayed with my friend, Sam, and she was always out of town. <clears throat> and then one day she was out of town with, with uh, her boyfriend and I had lost my key and my phone died and I didn't have any money. And I'm in Union Square on a park bench. I was like, I'm tired and I don't know anybody's number. I'm just going to go to sleep. Man, when I woke up, there was nothing but homeless people 
laying on a bench. One guy was like laying like on me. And I was like, yo, I'm going to die out here. There's no, I got to go back home. And that's when I went back home to Texas so I could, uh, I could recharge and remember. I went and visited my favorite teacher, Miss Cushenberry from second grade. I climbed my favorite tree. I so I swam the pool. I went to my elementary school, my middle school, my high school, hung out with my with my friends from little kids so that I could remember that mm. feeling. And then once I felt I was ready, that's when I went to LA. Yeah, man. I as as knowing you in person, I'm actually gonna get emotional. Um, I feel it in my body. When you talk about this remembering and what it is like, one of the greatest gifts that you gave me wasn't your joy. Your joy is, it's magnetic. It's, it's, it's like through osmosis, it gets absorbed into the people around you, but I'll never forget. We're in the park. I pop in town. I'm staying with Steph. We do a workout, but it's at the end where it's like, you just embody fun and play Mm -hmm. and authenticity. And it's like, it breaks down every barrier of the outside world and the pressure and the paradigms of I should, or I have to, or I get to. And it's like your presence helps everybody else around you remember, but I will never forget like just being there and knowing you and getting to interact with you created this level of joy in my body, but it wasn't from you. It was a remembering like, why can't I stand in the park and yell? Why can't I go hug somebody and dance? Like, why can't I, while I'm sweating and suffering, like laugh with everybody here? And it's almost like as, as through the world and, and the, the stories that we've lived and the experience that we had is that I willingly gave up the choice to have fun. It wasn't taken away from me. It was a choice to believe the evidence around me rather than what I know to be in my heart. And I think like when I think about everything, like I see it in your relationships, I see it. Oh my God, you're adorable child. Like just this <laughs> beaming light and like you and your drums and like you and your voice and Steph's party and you sang and I'm like, Hey babe, we're good. But like, I might have to bring Garen into my thruple with Stephanos. Cause like, I'm kind of falling in love right now. And what it is, it's like, oh, I love you so deeply. And I told you that. But it's this stark reminder to love that little boy in my heart. Yeah. And it, I think about this a lot because I watch everything you do and all my friends, and I'm so incredibly proud to know all of you. But you've said, I remember, I remember, I remember, I remember. And I imagine that when you go from being in federal prison for two and a half years and in that container, the only thing you can do is choose to remember and choose your freedom. And then you leave. And then you get dropped into this world that hit fast forward while you were away, right? Mm -hmm. And I know what that feels like. I'll never forget 13 months of my life in Somalia and I was deployed. So I was like, oh, I'm going to go home and everybody's going to be the same. And I went home and nothing was the same. And I felt so lost and so misguided. And it was like, wait, you got married. You had a kid. You're doing this. And I was like, it felt like I went in a time capsule and I got frozen in time. And then I got planted back into the future. And it took me months and months to be able to kind of like catch up. And so was one of your ways to to integrate back in is just going back to your fun and back to your play and back to your heart? Well, the thing about it was I wasn't aware during that time so all these amazing things would happen. Then I would stop doing the stuff that like really brought joy to my heart. Stop being my authentic self to follow what everybody else wanted me to do. I didn't know that that was the thing that was causing my life to go, like go down. I was like, man, where did it all go? I was such in a flow. I had so much momentum. Why is it not where it was? And then I would find myself reading another book again, but not knowing, not associating What I'm feeding my mind, who I'm associating with is a direct reflection to what is being produced in my life. That didn't happen until later on. So I had moderate success in music, moderate success in acting and modeling, and I was still unaware. And I was like, man, I just keep hitting this thing. But it wasn't until I got into somebody offered me to I got into health and wellness Yep. And they, they, there was like a free personal development seminar and I'd never been to anything like that before. And I was just like, I'm a go is free. It's Man, free. I went, 
And I was so locked in. I'm like, this dude is talking about everything that I've read in these books. But one thing I had never heard anybody say is leaders are readers. And you keep reading the book, you will keep growing. But you don't read for memory. You read for mastery. Mm -hmm. You read the book until it starts reading you. And that's when your life starts producing the result of the impl of the things that you're implementing. I'm like, oh, I typically read the book, think I got it, and then I stop. So that's where my 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 shift was. I never stopped reading the books. I never stopped doing personal development. People were watching TV and people were like listening to the to the radio. I was like, my new radio station was audiobooks. I was re and I remember I used to watch Animal Planet all the time. I was like, man, I'm about to watch. <laughs> I'm about to turn that same time and watching Animal Planet on my computer. And I'm just going to feed my mind with that same time. The average uh, household uh, American watches TV three to four hours a day. And I said, well, three to four hours a day times 365 days is quite a bit, quite a bit. So how could I turn my life as a university in the gym? a university washing dishes, a university on wheels. I Everywhere I had the opportunity to put these on mm -hmm. and listen to audio, I was listening to Power of Positive Thinking, Grow Rich with Peace of Mind, um, uh, just so many th different things, The Science of Getting Rich. Um, I, I was listening to The Power by Rhonda Byrnes, uh, A Mastery of Love. The four agreements, like I'm listening, but I'm not listening one time over and over because that's what I do with a really good song. I'm like, man, I'm going to play that again. You listen to a really good song, if even if you don't like the song, but it keeps playing. It sinks into your subconscious. Next thing you know, you're singing it. You're like, I can't get the song out of my head. Well, guess what happens when you listen to The Power of Positive Thinking by Dr. Norman Vincent Peale? Over 300 times. <laughs> you might be considered probably the most pow powerful, positive person. And it wasn't me. It was the information that was flowing through me that you can clearly see. I am the book. Like I am a reflection of the power. I am a, of a reflection of growing rich with peace of mind. Other guys, they, 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 they read thinking grow rich. They grow rich and then they're assholes. Yes. For me, I read a book called Grow Rich with Peace of Mind. So no matter how many millions I made, it was like, yo, man, how are you just like, you're so like calm. And then you're so like humble. I was like, well, I was reading this book called Grow Rich with Peace of Mind by the same author that read Think and Grow Rich. But he wrote that book after Think and Grow Rich. So maybe he had some extra downloads <laughs> about maybe I should like, Think of a way of being while growing rich. Mm. So it's those type of things that I turned into my house of mirror mentors. Everywhere I look, where can I learn? And I think, and I've talked about this, I dropped a podcast about seven weeks ago that broke people's brains and it was about environmental design and how we're the byproduct of our environment, not where we spend our time. It's everything around us, our office, our television, our house, our car, our furniture. And then this is the next level. And, and I'll never forget, I think you'll appreciate this. When I, um, <clears throat> when I sat with Mother Ayahuasca for the first time a long time ago, I was post-suicide attempts. I had overdosed and attempted to take my life. I was convinced I was a monster and that mm -hmm. I couldn't get better. I was like, how can you take life and witness people take life and do the things that I've done and somehow recover. Like I was convinced. And um, it was a shaman who challenged me because it was a very, very dark time for me. <clears throat> and he's like, well, what else could you think? It's like, well, what do you mean? And he's like, give me your phone. And he opened my phone to the music I was listening to and the videos that I was watching. I mean, you think about most country music. My wife left, my dog died, my truck broke down. All I do is get drunk. And then um, I was blessed to become friends with my dear friend, Jim Quick, a couple months later. And he said the same thing. And he's like, what are you programming your subconscious supercomputer to think when you're not present to what you're thinking? 
And I challenged myself and I stopped listening to all music with lyrics for three years. I only listened to instrumentals. I only listened to audiobooks. And then when I came back in, it was like Satsang and Nessie Gomes and, you know, these words and these things that were playing around me that were like programming, like how I thought. And so mm -hmm. like to hear you talk about this, I found it another way, but I can't speak for everybody listening to this, to the power of the intention about every single thing that you consume, that you listen to, because like if that news is on, you are using a mind control device to seed in fear and resentment yeah. and evidence collection. And if you're listening to music that's talking about cheating and infidelity and stealing and, you know, numbing out and drinking and doing drugs, it doesn't matter what your conscious brain is telling you to think because your subconscious brain is running your life. And so mm -hmm. I, I couldn't, I, I would like listen to this right now, everybody. And this would be the podcast I listened to 300 times. This would be the one just to go back to that moment and understand that. And so when you started embodying that, you said something earlier about like when you were hit with resistance, right? You had these yeah, ebbs yeah. and the flows and the ups and the downs. Yeah. And what it sounds like is like, you'd get hit with this resistance, you'd forget and you'd fall into what the world wanted. And then there would yeah. be a point where you remembered and then you'd yeah. fall back into who you are. Yes. And so now, now being where you are and thinking back, like how did you start to understand that that resistance was a calling to remember even deeper? And like, how did you start to build that momentum? So it, it's funny how it happened because there were, there were two, there were three things that were happening sim simultaneously. I decided that I was going to run for the 2020 Olympics <laughs> at age 40 which is completely unheard of. I'd have been gone out of track for years. And so I actually called my, up my old coach and I started training. And then I never ran consciously. I just ran off sheer talent when I was in high school and college. But as a 40 years young person who's in personal growth and spiritual psychology and things like that, emotional intelligence, I started running, there was like a purpose to my running and I would I would notice certain things. He was like, okay, you got eight back-to-back -back 200s with 30 seconds rest in between. I'd be like, oh man, man, it's going to be so difficult. And then I noticed, I was like, wait a second. So I started paying attention to my attitude around a specific workout that I knew was going to be hard. And I said, what if I just started saying, thank you, coach, no matter what he presented to me? What I noticed was every single time I said, thank you, when a, a resistance arised, something inside of my body almost grew extra wings. I felt faster. There was a different flow of energy that was, that was flowing through me. It's almost like. I was restoring nature with the words, thank you, and being grateful. And so I would just say, thank you, coach. He'd be like, man, the hardest workout. Thank you in advance, coach. I appreciate it. And when it was difficult during the, 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 the track sessions, when I'm just running, I'm like, thank you for making me better. Thank you for making me stronger. Because on the other side was the door to more. Every single time I broke through the resistance, I couldn't go backwards. I was I, I couldn't unsee or unfeel my way through the resistance that I just grew through. Well, how you do anything is how you do everything. So when I noticed that, I started noticing how when somebody says, okay, you got, I say, empowered brotherhood. Like, they're like, Garen, you got eight videos to do, like, by next week. And I'm like, man, God. I was like, wait a second. All this is is another form of coach. Coach, thank you in advance. Thank you for making me better in advance. And then I just meet the resistance head on by me just keep on leaning in and leaning in. Eventually, you make your old hard your new easy. By the way, that's going to be a title of one of my books coming out. Old hard, new easy. I love the it. The process of radical breakthrough. But... I would make my old heart my new easy by leaning into the resistance with gratitude and thank you. And so that was happening. 
I couldn't grow my hair for the longest time. And I couldn't grow my bamboo for the longest time. Then somebody said, you should change out your gardener. And I got a new gardener. He looked at my the 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 the, the, the planters outside where the bamboo were. And he was like, oh, you got the wrong soil. Okay. So he put in some new soil. And I was like, well, maybe that might be the reason why my hair didn't grow. So I had my hair, my scalp sample. They were like, oh, you're actually allergic to the shampoo that you're using. You got to use different organic shampoo, different soil. So I started using different soil. And I internalized that as a different mindset, right? So my hair started communicating with the bamboo and they were growing literally at the same time. And it hit a moment of stride. So that was happening. That was developing my patience, developing my mindset, and then training for the 2020 Olympics was developing me in a way to understand the bigger the race, the bigger the resistance, the bigger the gratitude. And so all of that was shaping me into understanding how to navigate through any troubled waters. I just got to understand what race I'm running. And every single time, I just remember, I just, anytime resistance is there, I say, thank you, coach. Thank you for making me. And I'll just shout it out, even at the workout. Nobody's really. I know you will. I know you will. I've heard you. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I just say, thank you, coach. Thank you for making me better. And they think I'm actually talking to that, the coach that's leading. I'm not talking to that coach. It's like, it's my relationship with God and it's me in a communication with God. And I'm just like, thank you, God. Thank you for making me better. I, I you set a dream, you, you set sail, you um, cast a vision and then the vision casts you. The vision creates you. You make a dream, the dream makes you. And so because I understand that formula, it just kind of keeps working. Kind of keeps working. There's like three things. There's three open loops for me and they're good, the threads to pull. Number one, I want to acknowledge you and you said this in, in, in passing really quickly, but the way that you talk about it, like I want everybody to hear that like this comes up every day. It's a choice to flex that muscle. It's not you have it and it's there because if it's there, it atrophies out. And so it has to be practiced over and over and over again. It's like brushing your teeth over and over and over. You don't brush one time and it's just there. And it's just there. And and I would say that I, in my life, I've seen a direct correlation to the more I do it, the more I'm required to do it on the next time to keep the growth happening, to create you know, that tension per se, to grow that muscle. And so I love that. Go ahead. Yeah, well, just imagine in video games. Can you imagine, did you ever play Zelda when you were, yeah. when you were little? Oh, yeah. Okay, so imagine in Zelda, if you didn't have the bigger sword, you didn't have the extra armor, and you're just on first level, and then they it instantly put you on the last level. Mm -hmm. That resistance would be too strong. So what do you do? You grow through all the tests and challenges. You face a dragon at the end of the round. That trains you literally for the next level. You lose to the dragon, you stay on the same level. I look at life in terms of video game. I'm like, oh. If I'm still in the same spot, I keep failing the same test or losing to the same dragon. And all of that is resistance. Yeah. And what I love is that, you know, you and I both have backgrounds in the PD world because that was a big part of my life and getting to where I am. But I used to do this. <clears throat> I did the PD work and I became a master at talking about the PD work. Right. And I was like, oh, this is my new place to hide. Right. Like I can out talk you. I can out quote you. I can out framework you. And I had convinced myself that I was doing the work when I said it in my head. And as subtle oh, wow. as this may sound, you, by example, of saying it out loud in a workout, thank you, coach, and thank you, coach, and thank you, coach, I realized that one of the reasons I stayed stuck for so long in my trauma, in my sexual abuse, in my shame, was because I kept it in the spot that was convincing me it was bad, and I never yeah. spoke it into existence. Yeah. And I love, like, I love being around you and even doing this because I've seen you do it. And it's been one of the most pivotal parts. And people are like, George, why did you say that out loud? And I was like, because that's my truth. And that's my integrity in the moment. And, and, and Garen, like, I couldn't do it for so long. So if you go back and you look at the evolution of my life and my clothing, I tend to repeat things. And so thinking about environments, 
<clears throat> when I was stuck in like trauma and I felt frozen from PTSD, I couldn't work. Like I convinced myself I couldn't work. So I bought Casey Neistat's hoodie that said work harder and I bought four of them and I wore it every single day. And once I got into the momentum of working, I created a hoodie that said unapologetically authentic. Mm. And my wife used to get really upset at me. She's like, you wear that, but you don't embody it. And I was like, I agree with you. And this is a reminder for me every day to practice that muscle. And yeah. then I wore it and I wore it and I wore it. And it was like, I'd be covered in sweat on stage. And like, did I just say that? Holy moly, right? Is that yeah. my truth? And then as it continued. And so for everybody listening, like it might sound really, really subtle. But when it's in your brain, it's not in existence. And when it's spoken out verbally, it becomes real and it allows yeah. it to do it. And so one question I have, and I love this, we're talking about like, okay, cool. We've talked about kind of forgetting and remembering and forgetting and remembering. And it sounds so easy. And I, and I hear right now, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to put in that. I'm going to be grateful for that. How do you find where to put that energy into, right? Because it's like the world wanted me to do this. And I was like, oh, it broke me again. And you're like, I'm going back to my heart, right? And and in yeah. my opinion, you embody everything that you teach. You help artists and creatives and you, you're just a beautiful fucking man. And I love you to pieces. And, but I know for me, and I'll ask this question for me personally, you know, I hit a point um, in my healing after that ayahuasca experience. And uh, I think, you know, Josh Trent, and yeah. I had a successful business and I called Josh and I gave it to him in 24 hours because it didn't feel like me. I deleted social media. I deleted my email and I walked away. But I walked away with a pregnant wife with no money and nothing. Wow. And it was the scariest thing I'd ever done. And I felt so lost. And I felt so lost that it like stagnated my feet. It felt like it cemented them in and I kept looking for answers and I realized that I wasn't going to find them until I started doing something. But there was this massive gap between like, okay, I have this space and like what it's going to do. And, you know, you're like, oh, I'm doing track and I'm doing this and I'm doing this and I'm going here and I'm going here. And I just remember like it felt impossible to even choose one thing to do. And I don't think I was in my yeah. heart and truly remembered, but I know yeah. a lot of people that are in their jobs or they're running a company they don't love or they feel like they're a different person. They've created this alter ego in their business yeah. and it's not aligned with who they are. Yeah. And I would just love to hear you riff on that because it's uh, you're a master at this. So I'll tell you, there's a lot of people that are extremely talented. They do good deeds. They do good work. They make great money. There's not a lot of people who are mission led. Mm. Like I'm on a freaking mission. You ask me a million times, this is what I'm on. Create a safe space for people to discover the gifts that already live inside of them so that they can use it and produce extraordinary results in their life and live a life without regrets. You ask me a million times, that is why I do everything that I do. And then give me any platform. I actually asked for any platform that is connected to this mission. If it's not connected to the mission, so I'll put it to you this way. When you're grounded in your mission, it should feel the same way inside of your body as if I said George Bryant. Mm -hmm. Because you've been rehearsing it so much. If I called you James and you didn't know me, you were like, James, you'd be like, that's not my name. And it just, it, it, there's a chord. There's a melodic vibration that comes out when any time somebody says a name. But one of the, the most sweetest spots inside of someone's soul is their name for the most part. So if you, you don't know me. I'm walking down the street and I'm like, Chris, doesn't resonate. So it's easy to not get involved with that conversation because that's not your name. Now, if I said, George Bryant, oh, my God, you're going to be like, I don't know you from somewhere. So when you know your mission, like you know your own name, anything that has a remnant that matches the frequency of your vision should make you feel the same way as somebody said, George Bryant. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't, that means you're not clear on your vision. You're not grounded in it. 
And when you're grounded in it, it demagnetizes, it literally demagnetizes all other distractions. So it's so easy to lock in on the target because you can't hit a target that you don't have. But once you have the target and you're grounded in the target and you rehearse the target, you know it like you know your own name, everything that's connected to it will come to the forefront. So you can see in a sea of people, you know who your person is. I can always see because I've worked with different personalities and everything. I know the kind of people that I can like literally do a one-on-one -on -one session. It's like, boom. And I can literally talk to a hundred people and I can have a two minute conversation with a hundred people. I know instantly because it's already connected. It's already connected in inside of my like spiritual DNA. It's the same thing when it comes to being grounded in your vision. Most people are not clear on their vision. They're like, well, my purpose is, my purpose is save the kids in Africa. Well, what if, try this on. If we are nature, which I feel we are nature, human nature, and the trees, they grow as, to their max. They produce as much fruit as they can. They grow as high as they can, as many leaves and branches as they can, stick their roots down into the ground as far as they can. It grows to the max. Could our purpose, if we're in nature, be to grow to your max? That lifts all the heavy weight off. Make all the money you can, earn all you can, make as many friends as you can, impact as many people as you can, love as hard as you can. Like, really, to the max. Your fullest expression in life. Okay, got it. That's covered. Now, what's my mission? My mission gives me direction. So I'm mission-led. And every platform I'm connected to, <laughs> it's because it it, it, it it vibrates with my mission. Let me digest all that. That's incredible. Yes. I don't want to lead this. And so how did you go about finding that mission? I know mine, right? Like I can spit mine. I'm like a repeat. It's like I'm a parrot at this point. And I embody it. My team says that I love it. It took me like seven years to be able to even articulate what that was. And it was like trying this and going here and being here. And in the early days, what I forgot to do was to reflect on like, is this an alignment? Does this feel good? Is this lighting up my heart? And so that's how I ended up building a multiple, multiple seven figure business that I had to give away because it felt so misaligned to who I was. And so now I look yeah. at it constantly. And so would you say, would you say it's fair to say that like the only way to find your mission is to get clear on like what lights your heart up and start trying things and paying attention to your body and your heart? I wouldn't is say the only, I wouldn't say the only, only way, way yeah. the only way I know how. Yeah. And you know, like little kids when they just get curious and they start this, what's this? Oh my God, what's this? And yes, I want to try that. If you get into that frequency of the little kid who's curious and you're really into the discovery frequency and you want to get curious about what lights your soul on fire, you'll find it. You will yeah. find it. You yeah. will 100% find it. It's, it's an, again, it's one of those laws of nature and I refuse to believe that we were just put on this earth to pay bills and die and then pass that philosophy on to our kids. I refuse to believe that. So there's got to be a reason that when I almost drowned, I still lived. I went to prison. I still lived. I lived in my car. I still live. Like somebody wants me here and there's got to be a reason. What's the reason? Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, oh, my God, is it ever going to happen for me? I'm like, why am I here? What's the reason? Start asking different questions. What's what's my mission? What am I here for? What lights my soul on fire? And then I do it. I do what lights my soul on fire. Because otherwise, when I don't, I get bored and I quit. Mm. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's that's almost not quitting. It's like staying aligned to your heart and into your soul. And yeah. that's what I love. And and it took me a long time to be here. Like one of the reasons we moved to Montana, like I felt out of place. We drove in. I'd never been to the state. We drove in. I was in the state for about two minutes. I called my wife in the car behind me and I'm like, hey, I love you. Uh, if you ever decide to leave, it's either long distance or divorce because this is where my heart is. Like this is home to me. And now I used to love traveling. Now I love coming home. 
because it like lights my heart on fire to be surrounded yeah. by nature and Montana and water and, and where I am. And so I absolutely love, <clears throat> I love all of this. I'm like buzzing right now because yeah. it's like so edifying, but I'm also like, fuck, I love this. And I'm like taking notes. I'm like, wait, I do all this. Oh, this is a good reminder. I get to free up some more joy today and go celebrate it yeah. and, and embody it and like be in it and do it. it it's really, really incredible. So uh, the last question I have is around your day, right? Like when you think about your day, do you have like rituals and practices and, and things in place that are there to kind of remind you when you forget or to get you back into your heart and your flow? Or do you set like a morning practice or a morning routine? Like, what does that look like for you now? Well, one, I've got an extraordinary wife and we hold each other accountable. And um, we, we have this thing called the love meeting. I'm going to pull it up. And we have it every Sunday. Oh, I love this. Okay, hold on. This is, uh, it's like magical. So every Sunday, matter of fact, I'm going to actually send this to you so you can read it. But every Sunday, we have this thing called a love meeting. And um, let me see. Uh, okay, George Bryan. Yeah. So we sit down, and typically things build up. And I want you to look at that, what I just sent you. And things typically build up if we don't talk about it. So this is our relationships version of church to recharge. And we go and we compare our schedule. So nothing pops up. I have her schedule. She has my schedule. We talk about it. And then we ask, do you need support with anything? Oh, day, baby, this week is a really big week. I got all these videos. I need you to champion me and cheer me on. And I'm trying to fill up two different retreats. I was like, come up with some names for me while I'm in the monotonous of work. And then my wife has been doing it all week. Boom. Then we talk about date night, how how we are doing. Does it need to be moved? Um, how can we make it special? And how can we improve from the week before? Then we talk about sex. What does this look like? Exploration, anything we want or need. Last week, I'm like, baby, I need you to flirt with me this week. Like, I mean, flirt with me hard. And then sometimes she's like, Baby, I want you to go down on me. Like, it's one of those things. It's just like, if you're not talking about it, I promise you, it's not going to happen. And then eventually you're going to build up this unnecessary resentment. So next one, this is the gold. Anything left unsaid. Are we holding on to anything, complaint, issue, or even a compliment we didn't say? Come from neutral. We are here to better our relationship. And the last one, praise for self. One, acknowledge one acknowledgement of self and one acknowledge, at least one acknowledgement for the other. Try to be creative and find something new. We do this every Sunday and it sets up our whole week. And then we come back on Sunday to set up our whole week. That's one thing I have in place. Another thing I have in place is there's a book um, called The Artist's Way. Um, and hold on one second. Yeah. So there's a book called The The uh, Artist's Way, and it's by Julia Cameron. And it's all about inner child creativity artists. And she has this exercise called The Morning Pages. Before you do anything in the morning, soon as you wake up, you just write without stopping three pages of anything that comes out. And then when you're done with that, you'll notice how the grogginess goes down. Your thoughts are more clear. Any negativity you've been harping, it just comes out and it's called brain draining. And you get that all out. So I typically wake up 4.45, 5 o'clock in the morning, go to sleep at uh, 9.30. Um, and that gives me an hour before the baby wakes up. And then we're in the we're in the day of mama feeding and I'm giving her, I'm giving her her morning tea and I'm supporting with the baby changing diapers, all of that. I can't give myself that before I give it to me. So I got to find time. If I need to sleep earlier than I will, I find time that I have at least an hour to myself. I do my morning pages. I have my morning uh, nutritional shake with my, my supplements. Then I go and work out in the gym downstairs after that, yo, I am on fire. I'm like lit, like it's nobody's business because you gotta, you've got, once you start up the engine of the car, 
It goes, Whoom. then it settles into the drive. That is my version of starting up my soul's engine. Some days it's different because my wife wants to cuddle, but she knows that I am a much better person when I have and I give to myself and I love on myself, my mind, body, and soul before anybody is awake. Mm -hmm. Man, I love that. And it applies everywhere, right? In life, in the relationships, in the business, in employee relationships and friendships and everywhere. Like that love meeting, like when was the last time you did that with a business partner? When you did that with an employee, when you did that with a, a long lost friend that you want to get re in touch with, like, I love this and I love yeah, you. You can mind. take that framework and change the words. Yeah, for you sure. Show the framework, change the words to fit your needs. Yeah, I love it. I love it. So I want to be respectful of your time. I could do a podcast for like six hours. So we'll do round two down the road. I'll fly into your new studio and we'll do it in person because I'm stoked to see that thing when it's done. Yeah, bro. I'm, I'm like, I'm stoked. And plus, I'm coming to Austin like once every six weeks now because I just closed a deal. So you'll see a lot more of me. Um, I love I just invited myself into your house. That's awesome. Let's go. Yeah, let's go. But I, I think for everybody listening, here's what I'm going to recommend. So uh, being around Garen is a guaranteed way to up-level your life. Guaranteed, mm -hmm. whether you like it or not. It's through osmosis. You'll feel the energy, you'll do it. And there are lots of ways to do it. Here's what I'd recommend. Numero uno, follow him on Instagram. Guaranteed. Like there is no way that that doesn't work. And I would even recommend when you follow him, click on the notifications and put him in the star list so that you can be filled with his soul on fire every single day. The next thing I would recommend is, didn't you name your book what the homeless guy said to you at the gas station? And my company, it's called Change Your Mindset, Change Your Life. Yeah, and my company. And so like this, number one, he has one of the most beautiful websites ever. And it is such a beautiful representation of his personality. His website is garenjones.com, G-A-R-R-A-I-N-J-O-N-E-S.com. Yeah. And I am about a quarter of the way through the book. I recommend that you get it. And I think for me, like thinking back on this whole episode, one of the most powerful things you said besides the embodiment of it is around that quote of like, don't read it to remember, read it to master it. And even yeah. this episode, I, I don't re-listen to my own podcast. I'm going to re-listen to this podcast and I'm going to have my team listen to this podcast because it lit my soul on fire. It helped me remember and it reminded me of who I am, like what that husband I want to be, what that father is, what that business partner, what that entrepreneur yeah. is like. I'm kind of fucking excited for the rest of the day to be really Yeah, thankful. let's go. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. And so for everybody listening, I'm not even going to let them do it. I, I make it a requirement. You might as well just unsubscribe from the podcast if you're not going to go follow him on Instagram and check out his website. Like I'm going to start putting ultimatums in place because yeah. there are things that you recommend and there are things that should be required. And I feel like consuming Garen should be required. And so I'm I'm blessed to have him as a friend and someone in my life. And so Garen, I like to end the entire show with one question, just one question. Okay. And so I want you to imagine that for the last 55 minutes, that everybody forgot everything that was said, or they just tuned in in this moment. And you have the opportunity to tattoo some wisdom on their soul that will be with them forever. What is the closing wisdom that you would tattoo on their soul for them to carry for the rest of their life? <laughs> I don't know if you noticed, but I, I, I was studying to be a samurai for four years i didn't know that <laughs> and i would always ask uh, my my master a question and he was like he'd say stop and breathe and he'd say you know what to do and i would always know what he was talking about yep there are people right now that are probably smashing their face with alcohol to stuff what's inside. You know what to do. There's yeah. somebody, some guy right now cheating on his wife. You know what to do. Or the wife cheating on her, her husband. Or the wife cheating on the wife. Or the husband cheating on her. You know what to do. Somebody money laundering right now. Someone trying to cut corners and find easy ways to get around business. You know what to do. Someone who's always showing up late for everything. And making excuses and, 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 and justifiable reasons. You know what to do. So for me, I'm going to reflect with my master, uh, uh, samurai teacher tells me, stop, 
breathe. You know what to do. Couldn't have ended any better. I will take that. <laughs> and I will highly recommend that everybody adds that into your arsenal really, really quickly. So, Garen, from the bottom of my heart, man, this was a gift. Your presence is always a gift. And you giving me this time and us this time means everything to me. And so thank you so much for being here. Thank you so you much. You are so welcome. Wanted to shout out Empowered Brotherhood. Yeah, yeah. If you guys want to know who the other leaders of the free world are, they're all my friends or business partners that lead Empowered Brotherhood. And they are changing the dynamics of the men in this world for a very positive way. That's kind of beautiful to be a part of and to witness. And so yeah. thank you for all of that work. And like I said, get into Garen's world. It's a guaranteed return on happiness investment, joy investment, and most likely prosperity investment as long as you remember to take a breath and you know what to do. And so <laughs> we're going to end it on that. I'm going to let you guys cue the outro, but remember that relationships will always be the algorithm. So you will either see me in the next episode or you will hear me in your earballs. but have a beautiful day. Take a breath, find the joy, unlock your heart and go express that authentic love that you have for the world and light your soul on fire. So Garen, thanks for being here. Everybody, thanks for listening. Without further ado, here's the outro.